addressing one of the most astonishing engineering problems of the modern society and accelerating the capabilities of the industry's most complex operations to building this completely new state and capability in the field of computing is the race to quantum supremacy. What cannot be seen as just a mere innovation and acceleration of the existing supercomputing capabilities and the possibilities of classical computers is this race to quantum supremacy that is a completely distinct and advanced solution to some of the world's most massive challenges driven by the principles of quantum physics. The race to quantum supremacy is yet an absolutely startling breakthrough by computer scientists and leading tech companies as what we now call the future. What, in what ignited this inquisitiveness in this field is when in 2019 Google claimed to have solved this arbitrary mathematical problem in 200 seconds which would have otherwise taken a modern supercomputer thousands of years to solve. Precisely, as quoted, it would have taken the supercomputer about 10,000 years to solve this arbitrary mathematical problem, what a quantum computer had solved in just 200 seconds. This capability of the future was solved using Google's 53 qubit Sycamore, which is a programmable semiconducting processor, a completely new capability in the field of quantum computing and computer engineering. This quantum computer possesses dynamic advanced capabilities elevated when computing works on the field of quantum mechanics. So what is the fundamental role of quantum mechanics? Well, I had to drop in this picture of what exactly a quantum computer looks like first, because the last time I spoke about a quantum computer of friend, they thought it was an elevated MacBook Pro. Well, so what is the fundamental role of quantum mechanics? What elevates this capability when we're trying to build quantum supremacy? Let's begin with understanding the fundamental principles behind quantum physics, the concept of amplitudes and measurement of subatoms. Amplitudes are essentially probabilities, but they are not like probabilities. Let me explain what this confusing statement means. Probability is any value that ranges from one to zero, uh, zero to one. And these, as we know, are the two fundamental units of classical computers, also known as binary digits, or an abbreviation, bits. Classical computers work on the system of bits, but quantum computers do not follow the principle of bits because what they follow are not probabilities, are not binary digits, but they follow amplitudes. So what are amplitudes? In order to measure the amplitude of a particular action, it involves the summation of all the possible amplitudes of the particular action and the ways the physical system changes and the ways in which that particular action could occur in. So the summation of the amplitudes of all of those possibilities is what gives us the amplitude of a particular action. So whereby uh, a system is measured in its dynamic state, in the way it changes, in comparison to the binary states and the traditional probabilities from zero to one as measured in a classical computer. So what this means in the logic of a quantum computer is that we no longer follow bits because we no longer work on the basis of probabilities. We don't have zeros and ones. We have what are known as zeros and ones and a linear combination of zeros and ones. So a subatom, a unit of a computer, now has a linear combination of zeros and ones. So it has a particular amplitude for being a zero and a particular amplitude for being a one. So what is this unit? It is no longer called a bit, but what we call these are known as qubits. Qubits are more scaled. Qubits are complex numbers, unlike the existence of bits, which are binary digits. So since qubits are complex numbers, they are governed by a different set of principles. And how exactly do qubits empower a quantum sense to computing? Well, this is by existing in a state of superposition. So as I had explained earlier, in the field of quantum computing, every qubit has a certain amplitude for being a zero and a certain amplitude for being a one. So a quantum computer's bit is both a zero and a one, and it changes as it exists in its dynamic state, as it has the multitude of amplitudes, sorry. And essentially qubits are the basic units of quantum computers. And what happens is when these combination of amplitudes of the particular unit are formed, they exist in what is known as superposition, as I had explained earlier. So how do these qubits empower an overall quantum sense to computing? So what do they, how are they measured by and how do they correlate to the other qubits in a computer? As I had referred to in the Google example when they had solved the arbitrary mathematical problem, it was through a 53 qubit semiconducting processor. So how do these 53 qubits correlate to each other? This process is known as quantum entanglement. 
So as we had looked at superposition, which is the relevance of the particular amplitude to each unit of the computer, quantum entanglement is how without measuring to each other, without communicating to each other, these bits, these qubits are aware of the amplitudes of each other and they can correlate to each other, thus forming a single system, which is our quantum computer at the end of the day. So the working of these qubits is what increases the scalability of a quantum computer to the infinite bits, which would probably be the size of the universe in the example of a classical computer or a supercomputer. So essentially a mathematical problem that was probably impossible and that is probably gonna take ages to solve for the classical computer, since now these qubits possess multiple states, they exist in a multitude of states, they can now solve these problems in just a fraction of seconds. So what this means is essentially doors have been opened to solving some of the most rigorous mathematical problems, to physicists, to computing several uh, unfound values in the field of quantum physics, and essentially it opens doors to many uh, high-scaled calculations that were uncomputable before. So what we understand from the fundamental functioning, or at least sort of understand in terms of the fascinating idea behind the principles of quantum computing, is the scalability through the quantum entanglement, and how superposition works in terms of the states it which, in which it exists in to do such great things as a quantum computer. Well, however, what dictates the set of rules and the way a functioning of a system is governed by are known as quantum algorithms, the third dimension which I will be exploring. Quantum algorithms are by far what run these computational capabilities of a quantum computer. Although classical algorithms uh, can be run in a quantum computer as well, quantum algorithms essentially take use, take advantage of the scalability as provided by quantum entanglement and quantum superposition in order to accelerate the scalability and solve such massive problems. And that is essentially when we deploy quantum algorithms. Well, let's look at a particular example of how exactly a quantum computer works in the range of probabilities and amplitudes and how exactly are the uh, benefits, the synergies of quantum computing when we take into account the field of quantum superposition taken into advantage. Well, let's look at the example of how a classical computer governed by classical physics of binary digits work. We have, let's say, let, let's take a game. You know, this is a very uh, common gambling game, I suppose, which is where you flip a coin. So you have a coin, a fair coin, heads and tails. You flip a coin, and the computer has its electronic coin, which it flips. And essentially, it, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to measure the coin, the answer which you get, and what the computer's result is. And if they match, you win. If they do not match, the computer wins. And what you understand from this is exactly the fact that in classical computing, when governed by classical physics, there's a 50-50 chance, assuming we have a fair, fair coin. However, in quantum physics, we understand that it exists in what is known as a superposition. So the particular amplitude it has is for being heads and the particular amplitude for being tails. So no matter whether it reaches heads or tails, both heads or tails have a particular amplitude for being each other. And essentially what this means is whether you have heads or tails, you're still going to lose against a quantum computer, which essentially tells us that if this was an actual game in a casino, gambling would probably be the most profitable thing, not to you, but to casinos, essentially because you're going to lose at the end of the day. And even if there was a possibility of the computer losing to you, it has been proven that this is likely more than 95% of the computer winning because it's mostly likely to be governed by mechanical failure when it's likely to exist in one state, which is practically impossible in the field of quantum computing because it exists in, as we saw, what is known as superposition. Another key example in the field of mathematics, which I was utterly impressed by, is at a young age, at, as young mathematicians, what we saw was prime numbers and how it was essentially difficult to compute whether a number was prime or not when we take into account much larger numbers. You know, if you have numbers in its 10,000s or 100,000s, essentially we find out that it's quite difficult to compute as we have to run a range of divisibility tests to see if it, if it is divisible by any number and hence if it's a prime number or not. Taking into account any arbitrary number, you know, 413,522,679, is this going to be a prime number or not? Well, we don't know. And even if we were to run the divisibility tests on a calculator or a classical computer, it's still going to loop through each possible digit that it can be divisible by. And what happens is this is going to take ages to solve. However, when we take into account a quantum computer, a quantum computer can compute this in a fraction of seconds, which essentially means that we've opened doors to mathematicians through quantum computing to find out whether a number is prime or not just in a fraction of seconds, which wasn't possible just a couple of years ago. 
This quantum algorithm is known as the Shor's algorithm that computes prime numbers, possibly one of the most startling breakthroughs that I had recently discovered and read about. A couple of applications which I will be exploring is in the following fields, essentially because what I understood is that what, what several physicists and com computer scientists start to contemplate about is the possible applications of quantum computing. While we know that we have opened doors to physicists and we've opened doors to mathematicians in solving some of the most complex problems, but how can this be elevated to solve some of the most massive challenges of our society? How can this drive operations of some of the key industries? Well, the first is climate change, probably one of the rebaking through uh, conditions of our climate in the present day. Well, let's understand how quantum computers can possibly tackle climate change through the features of quantum uh, superposition and entanglement. Essentially, it's all to do with scalability, as I see. Quantum computers are capable of simulating atomic level interactions. And what this demonstrates is a path to a new catalyst. Now, why do we need a catalyst in order to solve climate change? Because the current technology that our world possesses to tackle climate change is the CCUS the carbon capture, usage, and storage technology. And what the Inter International Atomic Energy Agency states is that by using our CCUS technology, we're likely to get rid of 50% of the carbon emissions and become a carbon neutral country by 2050, right? So if, if we're gonna wait till 2050 to become a 50% carbon neutral world, there's likely more carbon emissions that we need to look forward to until 2050. So the sort of scalability that we need to be focusing upon is in due with time. And what this requires is to speed up the process is a catalyst to overcome climate change as soon as we can. And what this can be done with is through atomic level interactions that can be governed by quantum computers. The second application is in the field of cybersecurity. Now, as you might be making credit card purchases and storing your passwords on several platforms, what you see is, is this term that says your password is end-to-end -end encrypted. And what end-to-end -end encryption essentially means is that your password can never be cracked as, uh, unless they have a decryption key. However, a quantum computer is your door to unsecure, insecurity because your password can be, crapped, uh, can be uh, you know, cracked using a decryption key, which takes a fraction of seconds to solve using a quantum computer's uh, computational capabilities. And finally, the last application is with respect to financial risk management, where your portfolios and their risks can be computed and to find you the best possible optimum profitable levels of your portfolio being managed at the earliest in the fraction of seconds using quantum computing to capabilities. So essentially what we start to question is, is this going to be the possibility of the future or can we achieve it as soon as possible as we take small steps in this field of quantum computing? Although it is very fascinating as we see quantum computing and the capabilities of it being governed by quantum physics, it is the talk of time. Thank you.